vilified by some, venerated by others. Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre. Was he indeed St. Marcel the Moderate, Doctor of the Priesthood, or a villain, or both? Today on The Meaning of Catholic. Brethren in Christ, Laudato Jesus Christus in Sequila. This is Timothy Flanders of the Meaning of Catholic. Jesus is King. Welcome to the continuation of the series. St. John Paul II the Great and St. Marcel the Moderate? Question mark. This is a series discussing St. John Paul II and Marcel Lefebvre and attempting, as best we can, to give a objective, sympathetic portrayal of both men uh, to investigate what were their motivations, what were their understandings, their teachings, and all the difficulties and wrinkles that go into this. Uh, this series will is bound to challenge a lot of narratives. It's going to upend some, make some people angry, but uh, I think that this investigation will help us fulfill the mission of this apostolate, which is to unite Catholics against the enemies of Holy Church. Uh, and as always, not all the opinions shared here by me reflect the opinions of other hosts at Meaning of Catholic. So the first part of this will be released publicly right now. This is just streaming for our guild stream. So at any time, y'all can uh, chat in your questions and comments. This is just an open conversation with the guild members. So thanks for being a part of the guild. If you want the full show, if you're watching this, the public version, if you want the full show, uh, you do have to become a guild member. It's at patreon.com slash meaning of Catholic. And you can also make a one-time donation at meaning of Catholic.com slash donate. And as always, if you can't afford it, you can always contact me. We could give you free membership meaning of Catholic.com slash contact. So what are some of the things we're going to be talking about on this series and this show? Here is my outline here. Um, First, a, a note on the canonizations, which we'll discuss in just a minute. Um, a very important point is the illicit and disobedient ordinations by Cardinal Wojtyla, i.e. John Paul II, uh, which we'll discuss briefly at the beginning of this show. Uh, and then we're going to be talking about a number of different testimonies and witnesses about Marcel Lefebvre. So we'll start with Athanasius Snyder. And uh, we're really... We're very much following Athanasius Snyder as we discussed in the first show. He has some comments about John Paul II, which are very positive. And he also has comments about Marcel Lefebvre, which are very positive. And I think that we can actually look at both men, as I'm, as I'm saying here, we can look at both men sympathetically and kind of cut through some of the characterization, the um, characterizing that goes on. And then we'll talk about a, a alleged quote from Joseph Ratzinger on Marcel Lefebvre. A very important witness is Cardinal Gagnon on Marcel Lefebvre. He was the one tasked with investigating the SSPX. And then Henry Sear, his comments, I think, are very great. Uh, he has a very nuanced look. He, he has some criticisms for Marcel Lefebvre, but also some praise. Um, and then uh, later on, we'll, we will be talking about uh, that Lefebvre used to be a liberal. Uh, the condemnation of Action Francaise, which is very important for his uh, the, the whole history of the 20th century. Uh, then we'll look at some of his moderate views. So Lefebvre and African music. Lefebvre respected by multiple popes. Why did Marcel Lefebvre sign Vatican II's Dignitatis Humanae? And did you know that Lefebvre was inspired by Paul VI? And he attempted to implement Vatican II's Perfecte Caritatis with the Holy Ghost Fathers. He also attempted to implement the what's what we might call the provisional mass, 1965 missile. Also, did you know that the founding of the SSPX was implementing Vatican II, uh, which included optatum totius, which promoted to Thomism, in fact, lesser known Vatican II decree, and that Lefebvre was careful to follow all canonical norms. So. Those are some of the topics we'll be discussing in this show, in this series. Uh, welcome to uh, Richard Cola. Uh, welcome, Jesse uh, from Northern Kentucky. Welcome, everybody. So on this show, we'll just have time to go through some of these, these basics to give us a perspective on this. Now, first, I wanted to read this quote from 
Are Canonizations Infallible? Edited by Kwasniewski. And this is this is going to, as a corrective to a comment that I made on the last show about Simon Stock, because we were discussing, is the canonization of John Paul II infallible? And I, I simply, I didn't, I, I didn't want to make a, a huge argument on that at this time, but simply to note that there are many complications on both sides of that argument. One of the complications is in, uh, in the case of St. Simon's Stock. Welcome to Fran from uh, North Wales. Welcome. Um, <clears throat> so this is quoting from Arcanizations Infallible, page 170, from the essay by John Lamont. So John Lamont is a traditionalist author. He says this. <clears throat> it is universally accepted that beatifications are not infallible. A good example is the purported saint Simon of Trent. Simon was a Christian child whose dead body was discovered by some Jewish residents of Trent in 1475. The entire Jewish community of Trent confessed under torture to having put Simon to death as part of a ritual murder ceremony. Fifteen Jews were burnt at the stake for having murdered him. A papal, a papal commissioner sent by Pope Sixtus IV concluded that there were no grounds for believing in the charges against the Jewish community of Trent or in the miracles attributed to the intercession of Simon. But this papal commissioner was expelled from Trent by a mob instigated by the local bishop who continued with the trial and execution of Jews. <clears throat> pope Sixtus V approved an office. So this, so this is the, the so for the first pope sent a, a commissioner who rejected this veneration of Simon of Trent and, and saw that this was an unjust persecution of the Jews. Um, but then his, his successor, Pope Sixtus V, approved an office for Simon for use by the Diocese of Trent and entered him, him in the Roman martyrology as a martyr murdered by the Jews for the faith. And then he was later removed by Paul VI in 1965. In this case, so Lamont comments, in this case, a person was officially commemorated in the mass as a martyr on the basis of evidence obtained by torture. As a result of this commemoration, a grave slander against the Jews was given credibility. This was displeasing and dishonoring to God. Nonetheless, it happened. So this is simply, I simply bring this up because I had, I had made a comment about Simon of Stock, uh, Simon Stock last, um, I'm sorry, Simon Stock, different, different St. Simon, Simon of Trent. Did I say Stock earlier? I, I apologize. Um, I, I had made a comment about Simon of Trent and I'm simply mentioning this to say that there are grounds for questioning this particular canonization, um, which was uh, removed. So, Lamont is saying that it was entirely, entirely fallacious and not only fallacious, but calumnious against uh, the Jews to to put this on them and commemorate St. Simon as a martyr. So this is the so if canonizations are infallible, what then do you do with something like this, where there was a, 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 some more or less formal canonization, which appeared to be totally groundless, and then it was removed? So which part is infallible? So this is the, simply the, I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to make an argument about it. I'm simply showing these are some of the complications about this situation. It does not appear totally uh, definitively resolved that canonizations are infallible. That, that appears clear. Uh, it does appear that the infallibility of canonizations is a, is a more well-founded opinion. It's, I think it's more of the, in the majority opinion, but it doesn't appear that that is something that ethics are required to assent to. Um, so that appears to be what, what is the case. But as again, you can read the entire um, <clears throat> the entire book to get more of those arguments. Now, I want to point out one more thing about John Paul II um, that rev um, regards him. And then we'll get into some of these comments that help us to look at the uh, objectivity as much as we can here. Uh, welcome to Alex. Uh, here is the article by Kwasniewski, and this is Clandestine Ordinations Against Church Law, Lessons from Cardinal Wojtyla and Cardinal Slippy. So this is <clears throat> mentions this point in Weigel's biography. And I'll quote here from Weigel's biography, where it says that, so Cardinal Wojtyla, so this is setting out the situation that Paul VI had forbidden ordinations to the priesthood, but 
Cardinal Wojtyla disobeyed this order from Paul VI. And it says that, so Weigel's commenting here, Cardinal Wojtyla and one of his auxiliary bishops, Julius Gorblicki, clandestinely ordained priests for service in Czechoslovakia in spite of, or perhaps because of the fact that the Holy See had forbidden underground bishops in that country to perform such ordinations. Ordinations. So the long story short, you can read this whole article, which I'll link below here, um, where it essentially says that Cardinal Wojtyla himself did perform a disobedient and illicit ordination of priests. So this is disobedient because Paul VI said that you can't do this. Cardinal Wojtyla did it anyways. He did it in another bishop's jurisdiction. Um, again, sort of, so he went around the rules. Now, concerning the, since this was published last year, this was in October of um, a little over a year ago, there has been one dispute over, there's a similar claim made by Kwasniewski regarding Slippy. So that is disputed that there was a dispute about that, but we haven't heard, we haven't seen any dispute as to Cardinal Wojtyla here, because this is based on a private discussion that um, John Paul II had with George Weigel, where he, uh, John Paul II revealed this to Weigel and told him that he had disobeyed Paul VI. So I simply share this to illustrate the complexity of this whole topic, because it does appear well-founded that Wojtyla did disobey and or, uh, ordained, ordained priests against the will of the Pope. And so since John, since um, Art Marcel Lefebvre did something similar, not the same, but it is similar, we need to look at all these things with a sympathetic eye. We need to try to be as um, charitable as we can with this, because I, I haven't seen, I, there hasn't really been a substantial response to this in, in a year. I, to me, this is quite explosive information that uh, really has not been explained by any anybody in writing. Um, there were some attempts on Twitter to just dismiss it, but uh, I don't find that convincing. So I, I don't think that we can just kind of uh, chuck this. Um, so that gives us some uh, some wrinkle to the, the nuance that we need to bring to this. Now, what we'll, we'll, we'll do in the final part of this public part of it, we'll just talk about Athanasius Snyder's comments on Marcel Lefebvre. And then uh, we'll also get into Cardinal Ratzinger and what Cardinal Ratzinger allegedly said about Marcel Lefebvre. So first of all, Athanasius Snyder. Now, why should we listen to Athanasius Snyder? I first want to just point out that Athanasius Snyder is a bishop of the Catholic Church in communion with the Holy See in good standing. Okay. So he's a bishop of the Catholic Church, but not only that, his books, so his book, Christa Finches, is, uh, or, is endorsed by Robert Cardinal Serra, Cardinal Burke, Scott Hahn, Father Aidan Nichols, and Father Gerald Murray. Also, his, his, uh, his latest book is endorsed by Dan Burke, president of the Avila Indus Institute, and Edward Penton. So... Not only is he a bishop in good standing, but he is promoted by some of these mainstream people. So I'm simply saying this to preface the fact that Athanasius Snyder is not, uh, you know, he's very much a trad bishop, but he receives accolades from these mainstream people. So we shouldn't just dismiss, that, dismiss his opinion as sort of this, you know, kind of crazy fringe bishop. Um, but we should take what he says seriously. So we already mentioned last week about that he did have some positive comments about John Paul II. Let's look at some of his comments on um, Marcel Lefebvre. So this is coming from an article at LifeSite by uh, our own Meaning of Catholic contributor, Kennedy Hall, uh, which is called Bishop Center Defends Pope Francis's Consecration of Russia, calls Archbishop Lefebvre prophetic. So here's the, here's the quote, and this is quoting from his latest book I just mentioned, Springtime of Ever Cain. So Marcel, um, or I'm sorry, Athanasius Snyder says this, quote, Archbishop Lefebvre was right 
It's often the case in history that people are not understood until sometime after their death. We can clearly see how Archbishop Lefebvre's arguments were correct, and we can see his deep solicitude and accurate diagnosis of the dangers as early as the 1960s and 1970s. He goes on, I think the contribution of Archbishop Lefebvre, I consider his intervention prophetic. It was a solitary voice, end quote. So these are some of the reasons why, hey, we should take this seriously. Uh, we do have witness of a, a, a great bishop, well-respected bishop, who, in his opinion, Lef Lefebvre should be taken seriously. So we're just going to take this at face value. And now next we're going to talk about Joseph Ratzinger's alleged comments on our Marshall Lefebvre. So but this that's the end of the public portion. So we're going to cut this off. So if you want the full show and the full series, become a patron member, patreon.com slash meaning of Catholic.